going on, guys? Welcome to the Dad Edge Podcast. I'm Larry Hagner, your host and founder of this show. Oh man, we got we got a topic today. No doubt. Here's the funny thing about topics. There's crazy stuff going on in my house. You can tell we're still like you know homeschooling at this point with COVID nineteen. You you heard that laugh, right? That would be my six year old. Anyway, hey, as a <laughs> so um, this topic today, we're going to be talking about the devastating effects of pornography on men, on marriages, on f- families in general. But a lot of us guys, man, we think of this as like super innocent and doesn't really affect anybody. It doesn't hurt anybody. And I got to interview my guest today and got to learn some things. I was like, wow, I never thought of it that way. Oh, wow. I never thought of it that way. But here's the funny thing about this particular show. Uh, when I, Whenever I launch a, a show on porn, having an expert on porn, like it gets very little social media engagement. Like, oh, I, I, I don't want to like that. Like, but I'll listen to it. Like these, these shows always end up in the top 10. It's funny. So, and I have no doubt this one will too. Today, my guest is, I'm going to try not to butcher his name. Forgive me. So Eddie Caparici, I think I said that right. He is the best selling author of two books. He's also a certified licensed professional counselor and is certified in the treatment of sexual and pornography addiction. He's written two books, like I said, Going Deeper, How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction. His second book, Removing Your Shame Label, Learning to Break from Shame and Feel God's Love. These are his two books. He is a best-selling author. And today he gives us some advice and a point in the right direction as it pertains to pornography. Um, And he goes way in depth on this show, and I'm so glad he did. Uh, He talks about how and why men actually struggle with porn. He identifies nine, I know it sounds like a lot, but he goes over quickly, nine different quote unquote children and the things that we are impacted as impacted with as a kid and how that then translates into our sexual practices as we get older. Like I said, super informative, guaranteed. You'll probably be able to identify with one or two of them. Uh, he'll also talk about why we think uh, what is innocent can actually lead to destroying a family. I asked him to go deeper on that particular topic. He went way in depth, took us down a path. I was like, wow. When we got to the end of that, I was like, looking at porn doesn't seem so innocent anymore. I can definitely see that. Uh, He also talks about some of the devastating effects on us personally as men of how too much porn can ruin our sex lives, both physically. Yes, yes. If you know what's up, quote, no pun intended. If you know what I'm saying, if you know what's up, how it can destroy our sex lives physically, but also emotionally, like what porn does to the brain over time. Some crazy stuff, man. Some crazy studies that he cites and statistics and what this is doing. And there's never been a time in history where porn is more accessible to men and kids. I think the average age now, get this, the average age of a kid actually seeing porn for the first time is eight years old. Eight eight years old. It's insane. So I'm excited to talk to, or I'm excited to present today's guest to you guys. I think you'll get a lot out of it. All right, gentlemen, no more talk from me. Let's get straight to the difficult and rather precarious and crazy conversation that I have with Eddie Caparici. Eddie, welcome to the Dad Edge podcast, my friend. It's good to, it's good to have you on. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, Larry. I appreciate you coming on and hey, congratulations for being in the top 10 of most downloaded shows before we even get started. <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate that too. Thank you. <laughs> well, I mean that. Uh, we've done, so I've done almost almost 600 shows now over five years. Wow. Uh, the, the ones that get the most downloads by far, sex, pornography, and marriage. Uh, I can't now, imagine. I can't imagine why. Can't imagine why. <laughs> the, here's, you want to hear something really funny though? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is a serious, serious topic, right? But I, mm-hmm. I, I got to warn you, you know, men love to laugh. They, they love to have some comic relief. And sometimes we take life so seriously. I'm not to say this, this topic isn't serious. It absolutely is. But I, I like to add some humor to these shows because it just, you know, it gives men a, a break, right? We hear so many things mm-hmm. and turn on the news and, you know, the world's ending anyway. So what I'll share with you is this. So... <laughs> When I, when I launch a show, like, uh, like if I have one of the Navy SEALs on or a pro athlete, man, it gets like so much engagement on social media, you know, downloads are typical, you know, but when I have one on pornography, uh, sex addiction or something like that, 
it gets hardly any social engagement, but the downloads are sick. So it's wow. almost like, you know, guys are like, Oh, well, uh, really want to listen to this, but I don't want to like it on social media or share it because what will that say? Right. So, and I don't, I don't blame you. It's not like I want to be sharing this stuff, but I'm, I'm happy to share it on the podcast and we'll be, we will be serving men as they listen quietly. So, <laughs> but, uh, you, you, my friend, you're an expert in this. You've got a couple of books out there. Number one is going deeper and your other book, removing shame uh, from removing shame label and which I, the cover of that book is really powerful because it's a name tag with the name shame on it. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that was my first book. And the reason I wrote that was when I was in my practice, it really, I was fascinated to see the number of people who were coming into my uh, office who were dealing with shame. I never realized it was such a major issue with so many. And, and I'm, I'm talking about folks who didn't even have, I wasn't even dealing strictly with sexual addiction or pornography addiction at that point. Um, and that is not the way we should be feeling and thinking about ourselves. And it's certainly not the way God wants us to feel and think about ourselves. And so therefore, the shame label is something I wanted people to remove and replace it with something different. And in my case, it's replacing it with the prince of a king. You know, for other people, it could be other things, depending on what their spirituality is. But all I know is one thing. I wanted them to get away from dealing with that toxic emotion that ultimately will just cause more and more pain in their lives. Yeah. You hit upon a, a topic that's near and dear, you know, men like to kind of go in the shadows. Right. And I, I don't think I've ever met a guy that hasn't dealt with porn in some way, shape or form. Um, most of us, I think are, we, we don't really understand like the damage it can do. We think of it as a pretty innocent thing. Um, the other thing I, I think that's really in line with your with your message, if I understand it correctly, is it's not necessarily about the lack or de deprivation of sex. I mean, really, right? Correct. Absolutely. It really has nothing to do with sex at all. It's all it's all dealing with emotional, emotional pain. See what happens is for folks who get involved in addictive behaviors, no matter what addiction they are, most likely those people can't sit with emotional pain. They were never taught at a young age how to deal with those sorts of emotions. So therefore, as a child, they have to figure out, all right, what am I supposed to do with this junk I got? And what they come up with, the solution, because they don't have a lot of worldly experiences, and they also think more from an emotional standpoint than they do from a cognitive standpoint. So the most rational thing they could think of is, I won't think about it. I'm not going to think about how much this hurt. And then the solution for not thinking about it is distract myself. Let me go watch endless TV, video games, uh, food. And at some point, they come across pornography and then they realize and they say, oh, my gosh, this is the best distraction in the entire world. This will keep me from thinking about everything and anything for hours. And that's how the whole thing begins. And it just snowballs from there. So, I, I mean, we're obviously going to dive deep into this topic, but I want to start with your childhood. Um, you know, this is a father show, Dad Edge podcast. I always like, I'm always so intrigued to get started with the guests at, at their, at their childhood. So what was it like growing up for you? What was it like with your parents? Oh, well, my dad died when I was five and my mother, Gosh. yeah, my, my wow. he left, he left my mom with uh, four kids, including an infant. I was number three. My baby brother was about eight months old at the time. Um, and mom suffered, this was back in 1963, and mom suffered a nervous breakdown when it happened. And so what happened is the four of us, our two older sisters, we all got shipped out to different relatives. Uh, people I didn't even know. I didn't even know who these people were. So here I'm five, I'm five years old, and I'm at a stranger's house, so to speak. I just dropped off, and I stayed there for about nine months until mom said, okay, I'm better. I can 
see you guys again and we'll come back together as a family. And we did. But again, that was just for a very, very short period of time because she had another breakdown. So we got shipped out again. But this time they sent us to different relatives. So now I'm sitting with other strangers who I don't really even know. And that that was about three to four months that I was there before she finally brought us back together. And mom was able to hold things down. But here it is. She had to go out to work. And again, you're talking mid 60s. Uh, you know, she had to really break her butt to make the end meet for the four of us. And my older sisters were the ones in charge of, you know, raising me. And of course, you know, what did they know about raising a kid, six year old, seven year old? So most of the time it was like, I would just stayed in my room by myself. And when I was about 12, my mom remarried. Um, and he was an abusive guy. He wasn't physically abusive, but he was a mentally abusive, he was verbally abusive. And, you know, we butted heads quite a bit until I finally left the house uh, to go off to college. Um, so it wasn't, you know, I didn't have the leave it to beaver, you know, some people may not even recognize what I just said. I'm sorry. Age myself. Uh, I, got, I got you, man. I got you. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't Leave have to that. Beave. Yeah, I didn't have that lifestyle growing up. Um, I had a very, um, you know, one that was uh, very full of anxiety, so to speak. What was it like for your mom? What, how did the nervous breakdown show up for your mom? Um, it was, she just couldn't function at all. Uh, it was like just strictly panic for her, a lot of panic. And again, I learned this later on as she told me about it at the time, I didn't even get to see any of it. Uh, but basically it became a point where, um, she just wanted to be in bed, didn't want to function, didn't want to take care of anything. Uh, there, as you can imagine, it must have been very severe depression that was involved in all of that. But at the same time, a strong a sense of helplessness and hopelessness because she's wondering, how do I make it easier with five of us? What do I do? And I can only imagine it must have been uh, terrifying for her because she actually was one of the strongest people I ever met. For a woman who was like about five foot one and weighed like, you know, a hundred pounds, she, she was very strong. She came through that after her second um, breakdown, came through it very well and uh, gave me a lot of really good insight and taught me about perseverance because she later uh, battled breast cancer twice uh, before succumbing to that when I was about 27 years old. But I saw a woman who really fought very, very hard. And uh, I saw her, again, raise four kids for about five years on her own, six years on her own. My gosh, man. So, and you, you personally, as you evolved, you personally battled with a lot of this pain that you talk about a lot yourself, it sounds like. Yes, I did. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and what I got caught up in, and trying to deal with this because I didn't want to sit with this pain. I didn't want to sit with any of the anguish I was feeling with, dealing with. So I turned to pornography and I turned to sex. Uh, I started sexualizing girls at a very young age. And, you know, I just saw them as objects. You know, I just saw them as, you know, Ooh, look how cute, look how pretty. And from the time I was about 15 on, there was always several girlfriends. One wasn't enough. I needed more. And I finally got married at around 23. I thought, okay, here's the woman who I can settle down with. But then I came to realize very soon after that, no, this wasn't going to work because anytime someone was paying attention to me or they were giving me this sense of affirmation, uh, it was like I was like a moth driven to a flame and I just went after it. And this continued till I was almost in my um, late 30s. And I had I had destroyed two marriages by that time. Um, I had left a trail of women who were broken hearted. And finally, I was like, I need to get help. And I went into counseling and I realized what I had was an attachment disorder, 
which as you can imagine, when you get separated from parents at a young age, you're going to learn not to bond with people because to bond with people is not a good idea because those who love you will hurt you. Those who love you will leave you. That was the worldview that my inner child developed. So therefore, I was always one foot in and one foot out of every relationship. And then when I finally did learn, okay, this is the way you truly have a relationship. This is how you bond. That's when I met my current wife, and we've been together for 23 years, and we've been married for 21. It'll be 21 in July, and uh, been faithful to her the entire time, which shouldn't have to brag about that, you know, but it was a major accomplishment. Um, and, and again, I've learned what it meant to have true emotional intimacy. And men who struggle with sex addiction and porn addiction, they don't know what it means to be emotionally intimate. Nine out of 10 of the men who come into my office, they have a very low emotional IQ. They can tell you if they're angry, they can tell you if they're sad, if they're happy, if they're afraid, but they can't drill down and tell you what they really feel. And even if they can, those certain guys who might, they cannot express it. They can't be vulnerable. Because to be vulnerable means, oh, I'm going to show I'm weak, that, you know, or somebody may use that against me. And worse yet, they can't take on someone else's emotions because it increases their anxiety. So therefore, what they want to do is they want to minimize it. It's not a big deal. You'll get over it. Or they want to shut it down. I don't know why you're worried about that. Or they're going to try to fix it. And as men learn to emotionally attach and learn to bond with someone in a true emotional intimacy, that is when the need for all this other stuff just goes away. So I apologize if I missed it. So I've heard of emotional intelligence. I've heard of emotional resiliency, emotional intimacy. Can you, would you mind explaining maybe the differences in all three? Yeah, emotional, emotional intelligence goes back to the emotional IQ, as I just said to you before. Those are people who just are not in tune with their emotions. They can't tell you what they're really feeling, except maybe the four major things. Um, when you get to emotional intimacy, what that means is that I can be vulnerable with someone. I can open myself up and share and I can let them be vulnerable with me and I will validate them. I'm not going to try to fix it. I'm not going to try to do it. I'm just going to be there to try to listen, comfort in any way I can, you know, depending on what they need from me. And that is, that's a skill set that for centuries would never talk to boys. Okay, that was not it. It was supposed to be you don't really feel, be tough, you don't show your emotions. Now, since the 70s, that a lot of that has changed. We tried to change that mindset, but it's still a stigma that's out there. And there's still many fathers who are teaching their kids, their little boy, be tough. You know, hey, you got your your skin your knee, stop crying, go rub some dirt on it and keep moving. And you know, that and that's wrong. We need to be able to let them feel some of that emotional pain they're feeling so that they can learn how to deal with it and adjust versus, oh, don't think about it. And they'll be a runner and run away. Because what they're going to run to, they're going to run to some addictive you know, behavior. Makes total sense. Uh, men are notorious about fixing things. So can we play a game for a minute? Why not? Okay. So I used to be one of those typical guys that would try to, my wife would come to me and be like, you know, Hey, you know, this, this and that's going on. Like the kids are driving me crazy. You know, this one left his clothes on the ground. I can't get the other one to do homework. I'm like, why are you getting so upset about this? Like, why don't you just make, take one kid's PlayStation away make sure he does his homework and tell the other one to, to pick up his clothes. Right. That was the old me like years ago. <laughs> like, let me just fix it. Don't get so upset. Now uh, I, I have learned how, how you can connect through emotional validation. So I think for me as a man and a lot of our guys that listen to the show who do life with us in our community, we talk about this, this step-by-step process and um, 
you tell me if this is on point or not. When my wife comes to me with something that's ailing her, what I try to do is I never say, I'm so sorry you feel that way because that's obviously sympathy, not empathy. But I say, feels like you're really overwhelmed and man, I can really, I get it. <laughs> Yesterday I was about ready to pull my hair out. These kids were peeing all over the toilet seat. Somebody threw food. It drives me crazy. Like I understand it, get it because you clean the house and immediately afterwards somebody is throwing something on the ground. How can I best support you right now? It feels right. And that my wife, even though she knows like what I'm doing because of the work and she, but, but she appreciates that. And at that point, she'll tell me, I need you to help me clean this up. Or I, I need you to help me talk to the kids or I don't want you to do a thing. I just, I need to get this off my chest and just vent. And at that point, I always, if she says I need to vent, great. Tell me what else is going on. And so that, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I mean, it seems to really connect us. Uh, but emotionally validating that one emotion, not trying to fix it. It's like, hey, I get it. We're shoulder to shoulder. I'm not up here. We're, oh, I'm so sorry. Patting you on the head. Like, you know, so sorry right. for you. Yeah, validation. I, I, yeah. Validation, the key to all of that. If that could, what you're doing is you're saying, I understand. I, I can feel what you're going through. Perhaps the only part I may do a little different is as opposed to when you first say, yeah, you seem overwhelmed, which is perfect. But now what you're doing is you're trying to say, look, I think I know what you are feeling and you're giving her a word. And if you were to say, well, I'm not sure it's overwhelmed. Okay, well, what is it? But when you then threw in what you, what, what, oh, I just went through it yesterday. And sometimes if women are impatient with that, they're going to sit there and say, oh, now it just became about you. What about me? I thought we were talking about me and now it's you. But you were able to come back around and to say, yeah, you know, I went through all that. I know exactly what you're feeling. How can I help you now? But I would keep that very, very short so that you don't get, develop that perception in their mind that, oh, it's his problem, not mine, that we're really talking about. Yeah, wait a second. I came venting to you, and now you're just talking <laughs> about you. So, no, that makes sense. So, keep that part shorter. That feels right. Uh, and then move on. Okay, cool. Um, do most men do most men try to fix because our emotional IQ is low, or do most men try to fix because that's just what we're wired to do? Uh, well, uh, most men are wired to have low emotional IQs. Oh. That, 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 that's the start. And it is because we have the low emotional IQ. We can't take the emotions that are coming at us. They're overwhelming. And our anxiety is increasing. And it's like, what do you do with this? How do I? I don't know how to help you. Okay. I don't even know what to do when I'm out of sort with my emotion. How am I supposed to help you with yours? So therefore it is more about who fix it. Or as I said before, minimize it or even just ignore it altogether. And, and, and those are all extremely hurtful for women because in many cases, to your point, you know, Larry, is that sometimes they just want to vent. Sometimes they just want to talk. And see, we don't quite understand that because, like, we want to talk. Well, I mean, I could understand if we're talking about sports, we're talking about politics, but talking about feelings, I mean, that, that's kind of foreign to me. That makes sense. So can you, so maybe we could break this down and then I definitely want to get into, you know, self-regulation through pornography and how harmful that can be and all that, all that fun stuff. But if you could give a, a man a map, wife comes to him, uh, blah, you know, like all this stuff, right. Going on. What's a guy supposed to do with that? Number one, don't fix, right? Right. Do not fix. The, the number, number one is validate. All right. So, so, so let's say you get that at you. The first thing you really want to be is curious, honey, what's wrong. Okay. See, that's where a lot of guys get in. And let, let me stop you. Should you yeah. not, should you never say what's wrong with you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely not that. <laughs> what's right. wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> but see, a lot of guys, when they get that thrown at them, what happens? They become offended. Like, talking to me like that? What's your problem? I can't. And now all of a sudden they're starting to get defensive. 
And once you start to become defensive, everything, the whole thing's over. Everything's yeah, you, done. You can't be curious and defensive at the same time, right? No, no, you can't. The other, but see, that's the other thing is that a lot of men lack curiosity. They don't go in deeper in conversation with women, uh, with their spouses and such. And that's part of what it is. It's like, ooh, wow, you really seem kind of out of sort today. Is it me or something else? What can I do to help you here? I, that's what you're, what you're trying to do is see if you can help to soothe them by maybe having some influence on them. But in order to do that, you have to be able to demonstrate that I am going to listen and that I'm going to hear you. And that's why when you go back to what you did, when we're validating what we're doing, if we're just parroting back, hey, this is what I think you're feeling. And this is what I think I heard you say. Is that accurate? And if you get yes or if it's no, no, that's not. okay. well, I'm sorry. You know, can you, you know, tell me again so the way I can get a better read for what's going on with you? Can I gently challenge that just for a minute? Absolutely. With, uh, okay, cool. Have you ever read the book Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss? No, I haven't. Okay. He used to be the chief hostage negotiator for the FBI. Okay. And he, he's got a whole chapter in his book about tactical empathy. You know, feels like, sounds like, looks like insert whatever emotion you think you see. Right. He says, steer away from, I think what I'm hearing, if I'm hearing you correctly, this is fill in the blank because he says exactly what you said in the very beginning of this is like, once you start saying what I think I'm hearing is all of a sudden your spouse is like, Oh, is it about him again? And what he's hearing? Maybe he's not hearing. So is that, is there truth to that? Well, I guess, yeah, I guess there could be some truth to that. The fact that again, because could again, it, it becomes more about, she, she gets the perception it's more about you than it is her. And we never want to have that perception that's given out because again, that's what they're always concerned. The perception is that we're in our own head. We're thinking about us. We're not looking outward to see what are their want, their needs and their desires. So yes, you, you're right. You do need to be more cautious that we don't give that kind of impression. Got it. Okay. So we want to empathize means not number one, not try to fix Number two, um, connect, right? Yes. And then for a guy's perspective, we always want to walk away from a conversation and be like, okay, yeah, we, we fixed it or we made it better. But quote unquote, making it better isn't necessarily what every conversation needs, right? It's just what you're really shooting for is maybe connection. Is, am I understanding that right? That's exactly right. In fact, okay. John, John Gottman, who the yeah. marriage guru guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what he says is like 75% of all conflicts are never really resolved in a relationship. Uh, so we're not really looking for that. You, you are dead on. What we're looking for is the connection between the two of us. So okay. Therefore, even though we disagree, we're still on the same team. Got it. It's not and like I, and you over here and me over there. And how do you know that that connection took place? Like, let's just say, because a guy wants to walk away from every conversation and be like, yeah, we solve that. So we're moving on. But if a guy walks away from a conversation and be like, well, we didn't, in my mind, we kind of didn't solve it, but we connected. But wait, how do I know we connected? Oh, you, you, if, if we're not connected, they're going to let us know. I mean, there, there, and there'll be many ways that they'll do that with one getting very frustrated at, at us to them withdrawing from us at times. You know, you can feel the emotional connection because the tonality of the conversation has changed. It is not two people who seem to be arguing it's two people who are trying to resolve things in a very calm, orderly type of fashion. Now, that doesn't mean that things may not pipe up, uh, peak up again, but then they seem to come back very quickly. Makes total sense. I appreciate that. I know this maybe wasn't the, the most focal point of this particular show, but hey, that's, hey, that's if, some, if it helps, if it helps people, I'm 
I'm cool with it. That's some good guidance, right? So let's get into this whole thing with uh, porn. Uh, I've I've had other guys who have come on who have talked about porn and the reason we look at porn and and like you said, it has very little to do with like the lack of sex or sex or getting. I mean, we could have a super high sex life, but still engage in porn. Um, so it sounds like from the beginning of our conversation one of the reasons we do that is because we want to, uh, we, we can't deal with the emotions that are on our mind and heart at that point in time. So we have to maybe is, is self-regulation even the, a proper term that we want to use for that? No, but unfortunately we don't have any. I wish we did. Yeah. I wish we did have that because that would make things so much easier. But yeah, I, I believe this, Larry, I believe that the road to recovery from, pornography or any kind of a sexual addiction goes to your childhood. I believe it's childhood pain point that have been unresolved. And what happens is there are events that happen today, negative events, that what they do is those emotions that come with those events seem very much like emotion from the past. And therefore, underneath the surface is kind of percolating for us, you know, this distress, this sore or nervousness and anxiousness. Maybe I just feeling kind of out of sort. And all of a sudden it's like I need a distraction. And all of a sudden I just grab a phone or I go to my computer. And before you know it, I'm off and running. But what we need to do is learn and to identify what are those core emotional triggers that activate us. And as I say, activate our inner child. And that's where the book came of the going deeper, how the inner child impacts your sexual addiction. And what I've done is identified nine different kids. Uh, For example, the bored child. Bored child grew up in a, he could have been surrounded by family and stuff, but he always felt alone. You know, he, he felt he had a very low key existence as a child. There wasn't a lot of stimulation that happened growing up. And then he comes across sex. And as I mentioned before, it's like this awakening. And it's like, oh my gosh, this is stimulation like I've never seen before. So now as an adult, when that man, that same person feels flat, no energy, life is dull, off and running to porn. Uh, Another child would be the need for affirmation. These were kids who grew up in homes where they didn't get a lot of praise or they may have gotten a lot of criticism. And so therefore, you know, now as adults, if people are reaping praise upon them, if they're doing that, then they're going to be more likely to be gravitating toward that. And believe it or not, and I never realized this until um, really started studying this about eight years ago. There are men who, when they watch pornography, get a sense of affirmation and a sense of the fact that they're being someone paying attention to them as they're looking at the women and their faces and they feel like they're just there for them. And that's why porn serves for that vehicle also for the unnoticed child. That's another one. Uh, So either for the unnoticed child or the child who lacks uh, affirmation, porn could be a way for them to get those. There's the stressed child, the uh, need for control kid, the sexually abused child. Um, So again, there's a total of nine of them all together. And they all have different emotional pain points. And with that, they all have different emotional triggers that activate them. Wow. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I I went pretty deep with all of it. You did, yeah. so, but, but I, I would think for the most part, men, grown men, grown adults, like they're, they're not thinking about it that way. They're Never. thinking about it like, oh, like, hey, I just, I, I need to relieve some stress. I just, wanna, I just want to go look at something and not think about all the crazy things going on. And right. we, lo- we look at it pretty innocent. And so tell me this, everyone, most of the experts that I've talked, well, every expert that I've talked to on the show always shares that this is devastating to marriages. It's devastating to legacy. It's devastating to your kids. But I think most men don't view it that way. They're like, oh, well, I just, you know, I go take my phone in the other room and do my thing. It takes like four or five minutes and I'm done. Like, 
and there's no harm, no foul. No one got hurt. I don't understand how this is destroying anything. So how is it destroying things? Yeah, see, but, but that's, that's the thing. The mindset is I'm not hurting anybody that, you know, I'm not, it's not a flesh thing. I'm not touching somebody else's flesh and they're not touching mine. However, there, there are many different factors. A large majority of women, not all women, there are some women who actually watch porn. Porn, porn is actually growing among, the, among women at a very fast rate that we're seeing right now. But pornography, especially when we start watching at a young age, is teaching us, because again, this is how we're learning about sex, right? And we have a whole new generation over the last 20 years. They've learned about sex from pornography. And the message they're getting is little boys are learning it's okay to objectify little girls. But even worse yet is little girls are getting a message it's okay to be objectified. So now you start taking that into your relationship, into a marriage. And so therefore, you're not looking at your wife as someone who you want to emotionally bond with. You're looking at your wife who you, is somebody who you want to physically bond with. And, and because they confuse emotional intimacy with physical intimacy. So they think, oh, by, by us being physical, you know, quite often and me touching you all the time, that shows how much I care and how much I love you. And that's what they feel. But the wife's like, whoa, 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 wait, there, there's more to this. Where's the romance and the love? It's like, okay, great. I'll hear here's some flowers or I'll say I love you every once in a while. They sprinkle that in on top of the foundation that they created of physical intimacy, but it's not a love. And what happens is spouses start to feel used and taken advantage of. There are more than 150 studies that are out there that show the different devastating impact of uh, pornography on relationships. And one that's very, very interesting is that over time in, in viewing pornography, a man is going to start to lose interest in his wife. He's going to start to find her less attractive going to find her, find her less sexually satisfying because he's going to be looking for more from her in that area than she may want to give. And now he's looking at it and saying, oh, you're a prude. You know, all women do this. Well, no, not all women do that. You know, maybe women who you're watching from pornography do it, but not all. The other aspect of it is that, you know, nearly almost 50% of the cases it, it escalates. Somebody who watches porn will escalate to something else. They definitely escalate in what they're watching from a pornography standpoint. When you started watching and you're looking at naked women, you know, because the tolerance level in the brain reaches its max, that's not doing it for you anymore. So now I need to see something different. I need to see something more, you know, not more, it's different. That's the thing about the addiction. It's not about more, it's about different. And before you know it, you're looking at stuff that the human eye should have never, never should see. And we're building up all these images in our head that are putting us in a rather dark place. Also, pornography, people start to withdraw more because they're due. They are starting to feel that sense of withdrawing. So therefore, you get that aspect. We find that they distance, distance themselves from their family and their loved ones. And it's also the fact is that when you get caught, you know what? It affects almost the whole family in most cases because the kids wind up realizing mom's upset about something. What is mom upset about? They may overhear what's going on. They may actually stumble across the porn on the computer or on your phone. You know, I can't tell you how many cases I've seen of that over the years. So now your kids are looking at you like, wait a second. I thought you were the leader of the house. I thought you were the guy I was supposed to be. You're my role model. You're the person I'm supposed to be following. And you're doing this? So now your credibility is shot. And with hey. that, so is your legacy. Well, that puts it in a whole new, different perspective. No, it really does. Well, that's only, that's only part of it. I mean, go on and on and on. Right. Um, well, no, yeah. Not, get, not a good thing. Go, go a little further. Go, yeah, <clears throat> keep going. About uh, the different, the nature of it? Um, no, I mean, well, yeah, like I would say not the, like the ripple effect. So like that, that illustrated a 
very powerful point because we started like, oh, well, I'll just take my phone in the, in the other room right. for a few minutes. And now it's like you, you, you uh, talked about like, well, intimacy wise, it desensitizes you physically. It, it may desensitize you. It's not enough. We're seeing things yep. that the, that the human brain and human eyes should never mm-hmm. see. Not only that, but it could destroy the marriage because you don't really view your wife as sexy anymore. You need more from her. It's all about physical intimacy, not emotional intimacy. So it causes you to withdraw. And then your kids are looking at you like, wow, like this is what you're doing in your spare time. I thought you were supposed to lead. So you, you took it from like, oh, I just do this for a minute and then I'm good to like, wow, I just destroyed my entire family. And well, you, know, you, 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 listen, you listen really well. I do. I, I'm a good listener. <laughs> So let me tell you more. Okay. Yeah, please. What, what it also, what it also does, it has a physical effect on us. Okay. Not just from the standpoint that it could make us feel more depressed, but, and want to withdraw, but also we're seeing that chronic masturbation. All right. Has a serious impact on a man's ability to get an erection. Yeah. I have heard that. That will okay. scare you. Right. And and even if you can maintain the erection over time, it prevents you from being able to ejaculate because you, you you're just let's face it. OK, if I, if I try not to be vulgar at all, but the feeling of a man's hand does not match the feeling of a woman's vagina or her mouth. OK, it's nothing like the same. So therefore, you're used to one thing. Plus, you're also used to all these images in your head. And now you go for the real thing and guess what? You got to start thinking about some of those images in your head. Now you're disconnected from your partner and sooner or later they pick up on that also. And they feel that distance that goes on. Plus it's also devastating for them because they start looking at it and saying, what's wrong with me that you cannot get an erection? What's wrong with me that I can't bring you to an orgasm? There's got to be something about me. Oh, my gosh. And so, therefore, now you, again, what are we doing? We're not connecting, which we agreed at the beginning of this uh, show that that is the key to all of this. We are disconnecting. We're growing apart. And then you wind up having the shame and all of that that's involved in it. And before you know it, people are going weeks, months, years without being sexual with each other because you know, of what has gone on from a pornography standpoint. Dang. There's also the idea of what it does to a woman in a sense that she's now betrayed. And, and women, there are a large majority of women, they look at pornography no different than they look at someone who has an actual affair. And and, and the worst of all of them is the emotional affair. I, that That is the kiss of death. Yeah. But anyway, but they look at pornography and they say, this is cheating. Because you're bringing other women into our relationship. And the guy can sit there all he wants to try to justify it. You're not going to change her mindset about it. That's what she feels. And when that happens, then it becomes, why do you need that? Why am I not good enough? So now you're crushing her self-worth, her self-esteem. And now we haven't even gotten to the part of, oh, well, wait a second. What about those women who are in pornography? Don't women want to be doing that? Now, yes, there are some who get involved because they're doing it for the money and what's going on. That's part of what happened. But but I always tell my guys who try to justify pornography, I always tell, I ask them this question. Tell me the time you met that 12-year-old girl. And you asked her, honey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, you know what? I think I want to take my clothes off in front of a camera and have sex with strange men and women. Where is she? I haven't found her yet. Now, I know there are girls out there that that they could exist. But those girls have been severely scarred already. They have been abused and they have been hurt. So what we're doing with women who are involved in porn, okay, because there are many of them, they'll tell you the horror stories. You look and you see what the women who've been in pornography, and when they come out and they tell you the horror stories of it, what we're doing, we're just take, continuing to take away whatever dignity they have left by being part of all of this. 
and we need to stop. Mm. You mentioned up a, you mentioned two words in there too, which were shame and guilt and men. It's like, I mean, I would imagine even in a counseling office where you're seeing, you know, your clients one-to-one doors closed confidentiality yet this is such a hard topic for dudes to talk about. Like they'll talk about anything else except for their habit with porn. So how do we get out of that shame loop and that guilt loop? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, it's a very, very difficult uh, thing. First and foremost, we start to get out of it by trying to put an end to it. Do the things you need to do. And that is one, get some accountability. Get software that we could put on your phone and your computer so that you can, you know, if you try to access, someone will get a report about it and they'll confront you with it in a very loving and caring way. Surround yourself in community. Go to a support group and be around good people, good men who are going through what you're going through. That will help you along that way. Three, own it. Own it. That's up to it. You know, and and, and put it out there, not for the world to see, but at least for your spouse to see, look, this is where I'm struggling. This this is where I'm doing. This is what's going on. And then sit with somebody to learn why did this all begin in the first place? What happened? Where did I go wrong? Because, again, I'm a believer. If I know why I do the things I do, I believe I am more empowered to change. Mm. And I think those are things. And once you start to do that, once you start doing the work and you start to see, wow, I have control over this. Because, see, a lot of guys think they have no control. I have control that a lot of that shame start to, to die down. You mentioned talking to your wife. As men are hearing that, I'm sure they're scratching their head like, I could never bring this to my wife. How do we, because I've, Men I don't view porn the same way a, a woman does. Like a woman, like you were talking about, like, wow, the, you, I feel incredible. I feel like I'm pretty much cheated on me. Right. You know, emotionally, like, oh, am I just not enough? Like, they, it, it's horrible. It's devastating to them. To a guy, it's like, no, I was just, I was stressed out. I just needed to, you know, release. Like, mm-hmm. that's really, really, I still love you. I'm still attracted to you. You're everything in the world to me, but I just, I just did that. And, so how do we, if guys want to have that conversation, how do we even start something like that? Well, well, let's, let's take a step back first. Uh, could you bring up a really good point? You know, I'm of the belief that most guys know where their wife stands when it comes to pornography. There's been some sort of conversation that has happened around it. And, and if you're doing it and you're hiding it, then you know she's not going to be cool with it. And if you're doing it and you're hiding it, but you realize and now, because hopefully you hear things like this and you realize, wow, you know what? If she does know, it's going to hurt her. And I don't really want to hurt her, but it's better for me to go and tell her, look, I'm struggling. I have a problem. I most likely have had the problem. Most likely they had the problem long before she ever came into the picture. Okay. But to be able to come out and to admit, I have a problem, I'm going to seek help for it. But this is what's going on. Yes, they may, she may be hurt by that, but I'm telling you, she's going to be so thrilled by the fact that she didn't have to go find it. She didn't stumble across it, that you were man enough to be able to say, there's something wrong and I need to fix it. And that means you've just taken a big step and not just one trying to get rid of your pornography, but you made a big step in learning and being able to connect with her. You've been vulnerable. You've been open. And that's what the big key here. You mentioned there are there's software, I guess, out there that helps somehow keep you accountable. Is there anything that you recommend? Uh, yeah, Covenant Eyes one that I really like a lot. Um, what they do, it doesn't stop you from going places. What it does, it, it manufactures a report. So what you do is you find somebody, your safe friend or, you know, maybe your brother-in-law, whoever it might be, uh, even your counselor. I, I, I served for about 
a dozen of my clients and I get the report once a week and I get to see has there been any suspicious activity and then I can go and check on it. Most when guys give it to their counselor, those things are clean. <laughs> they don't they don't want to come in here and be saying, oh, messed up with all of this. So it's, so it's very clean for them. So I think that part of it. Now, look, I don't want guys on these things forever. I don't want them to be in this box being contained. What I want them is transforming and changing their heart that over time they don't need these devices. They can be trusted because they do have integrity. They have integrity. And therefore, I can, you know, I don't need, you know, to be locked in, like I've said before, into a box. What do you say to men? What advice do you give to men who are in in that moment where they feel triggered? And they're like, and they feel that, you know, there's like a tremendous buildup of energy. They're like, oh, I just got to, I'm stressed out. I just want to go and whatever. Right. Um, what do you, what do you tell men to go do in, in that moment? Like go for a run, maybe do some push ups, maybe well, run some well, stairs, <laughs> burpees. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing they need, first thing you need to do would be mindful that you're in that mindset. Right. So that you can try to stop it, to cut it, to, to get it to cease. So I need to be mindful. Once I'm mindful, then I'm going to be in the process of slowing everything down. Okay. Why? Why do I have this urge right now? Um, and, and that's why when you, again, in the book, it talks about those emotional triggers that could be activating it. But another way you could get activated is if you're drained. If you're drained mentally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually. And I'll say that again. Mentally, emotionally, physically, or spiritually. I say it. My, my guy gets sick of hearing me say it. But when we're drained, bad things happen. Because the brain is looking for stimulation. And that stimulation doesn't even have to be running to porn. could be running to food. It could be a loose tongue. It could be the fact that you have no patience. It could be that's why you lash out at people. And that's why you got to be checking throughout the day to see, am I replenished? But then to go back to your question, I slow things down. Okay, what has happened here? Because I was good. Everything's fine. I have no urges. Now all of a sudden there's an urge. Something changed and you need to try to sit there and sort it out. And then after you, if hopefully you figure it out, even if you don't, I'm picking up the phone and I'm calling one of my support people. Okay. Hey, get what struggling right now with guys or I'm texting somebody about it. Um, you know, that maybe I'm finding a lifeline. Like you said, I like to run. Running's good for me. I'll go run. you will make me exhausted. I'll go do something like that. But see, I don't want people to get away from sitting with whatever the pain point is. They need to be able to do that too. And then bring in that lifeline to help them. Mm. Super informative stuff. Good work you're doing out there, man. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. A lot of a lot of people out here, um, as I say, we're in the trenches yeah. uh, doing this kind of work to try to make a difference in men's lives. Because I want men to have good legacies. I want them to finish strong. I want them to have strong marriages. Um, I want them to be a, a, a connected. I want them to be good role models for their kid. So this way you're teaching your daughter, hey, I'm the kind of guy you want to wind up marrying. Okay. And you're teaching your son. I'm the kind of guy you'd like to grow up to be. I like this, man. This is really good advice. As we wrap up here, what have we, what have we missed? What have we not talked about that you think is really important? Well, I, th- I think we really pretty much covered everything. Like I said, you're a great listener. So you've got oh, a lot of Thank good you. questions with that. <laughs> uh, and I, I think you really took me right along the whole spectrum of what we're doing. But I think if I'm going to end it with anything, I would tell guys, you know what? Don't be afraid. Do not be fearful for trying to take this and bring it out into the open. I I know it's scary. I got it. And, And hold on to that fear and do the right thing. What is right for you? What is right for your marriage? What is right for your family? And what's right is to get over this, to get through this, learn to manage it. This disorder doesn't go away. 
the urge, desire will always be there, but it's learning to manage it effectively to be the man you've always wanted to be. This has been really helpful. Eddie, your book, Going Deeper, Understanding How the Inner Child Impacts Your Sexual Addiction, The Road to Recovery Goes Through Your Childhood. Amazing cover, by the way. Was Thank this... You. Was this Actually, you, know, did, you can see it back here. Keep I know. The big, yeah. I saw it, that, that. That, is from, that is from Burning Man, uh, 2015, by European sculptures, artists. I like put it. that together. It's awesome. Yeah. Yes. Sweet. So obviously your book is on Amazon. I'm looking at it as we speak. Uh, where else can men find your resources, your books? You can, you can find this book on any uh, book outlet that's out there. A, um, Barnes and Noble, a book, some of anything that's there. They can also go to my website, uh, www.innerchild.com dash sex addiction inner child dash sex addiction.com and they can find it there they can also find my online program uh for recovery too that's available very cool man this has been super helpful i've really really enjoyed it a lot uh this is i've we've had many discussions on pornography sex addiction but this has been i, I like how we started with even emotional validation and conversations and even got to this so it was quite a quite a cool road. Uh, we're going to have guys, don't worry about it. We're going to have all the links in the show notes to connect with Eddie, to grab a copy of his book. Uh, this is episode 276. So, um, Eddie, I really appreciate you coming on and, and talking about a topic that is super tough for all of us to talk about, to even fathom. So this was really helpful. Well, thank you. Thank you for putting to, for giving airtime to it. You know, I wish more people would do that. Yeah. Like I said, this show will be huge, but it won't get much social media engagement though. People will be like, I like that, but I'm not going to publicly like it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so gentlemen, again, not to worry, go to gooddadproject.com forward slash two seven six for my interview today with Eddie. And this is the way that we live intentionally. This is the way that, Hey, as men, there's many temptations out there. This is the way we can beat things like porn together. Like he said, find an accountability partner, find a community. Uh, you guys heard it in the, in half the show, we've got a mastermind community, uh, the data Alliance mastermind community where we are very open. And we talk about this, like literally it's kind of funny. We talk about, we're like, we talk about porn, like it's anything else. Like, Oh, the sun's out. Oh, I looked at porn today. I need, I need some accountability. Like literally it's become that easy. So Eddie, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for coming on today. You, your words of wisdom and, and the ease of the conversation, I must say, I really enjoyed as well to talk about such a tough topic. Thank you. I enjoyed it too. You bet. Gentlemen, go out and live legendary. Take care.